recording. Today, I think Arthur is are going to be telling us about recent work that they've been doing associated with the discovery grant that they've held over the last few years, and also, I think, some work that they have planned for the future. So thanks very much, Arthur. I'll hand over to you. Oh, thanks, Richard. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that actually, it's, it's today, five years ago, that I gave a talk on, um, on this project, and uh, soon after that, we got awarded the, the ARC grant for four years. So... I'm hoping for Groundhog Day, so I'm going to really focus on what we plan to do if we get funded, and I'm hoping that uh, that we are successful this year for another four years of funding from the ARC. So the, the topic I'm talking about today is the epigenetics of sex in dragons. Uh, the previous topic was the genetics of sex in dragons, and so this is... Um, this is moving from the genetics to the epigenetic uh, aspects of, of sex determination. Um, I'd like to try and make a connection across to a broader audience, and I'd like to do that by introducing the concept of phenotypic plasticity, which would be familiar to uh, all of you. Uh, phenotypic plasticity is the uh, influence of environment on the translation of the underlying genetic blueprint of a species to that species, uh, to the organism's particular phenotype. So um, individuals of a species can have multiple phenotypes and even individuals that have exactly the same genotype, that is identical twins, can have quite different phenotypes. And, and that's because of the concept of um, phenotypic plasticity where environment moderates the translation of the genotype to the phenotype. And this is of particular interest to ecologists and evolutionary biologists because the manifestation of the genotype depends very strongly on an environmental context. And so obviously it's really important for um, you know, weed control, for example, with Richard, where um, the impact and the interactions of species with the control measures depend on the context in which um, they're being applied. So really important concept for evolutionary biologists and ecologists. So basically you have the genotype, which is the blueprint for a particular uh, individual, and it doesn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the phenotype in most cases. Environment comes in and moderates the expression of that genotype into, or the translation of that genotype into a phenotype. And, and that, this is really important for the evolutionary biologist because natural selection acts on the phenotype, not the genotype. And the genotype therefore evolves under natural selection, which is acting on the phenotypic um, expression of that genotype. And if environments are moderating uh, the phenotype, uh, then uh, clearly um, the way in which the genotype evolves uh, depends not only on the filtering that the environment gives through natural selection, but also on the manifestation of the genotype into a phenotype. And, and phenotypic plasticity itself evolves because it allows rapid response to local conditions that have historically fluctuated. So the, the evolutionary history of the species uh, is manifested in its ability to rapidly respond to those varying conditions through phenotypic plasticity. Okay, so it's all about selective advantage in the context in which we work. In the health context, uh, they talk more about a, a developmental programming. So programming of various bodily systems by a stressor during pregnancy or during the neonatal period is the focus in, in the health uh, area. So basically you have the genotype of the individual that's uh, in the womb. And then you get stresses that can be applied. You know, the, the mum might get a fever or she might unfortunately be drinking alcohol at the wrong period of time. And there are various other stresses that can moderate the genotype of that individual into uh, a different phenotype. And it's of particular interest to medicine because it deals with responses to insults to the developing embryo that lead to deleterious outcomes and so disease. So the, the medical people are, are really um, interested in developmental programming and the translation of the genotype to a phenotype in the context of environmental uh, stresses. 
So again, we've got the same diagram. You've got the genotype going to a phenotype. It's not a one to one correspondence. And you have these environmental stresses, uh, which lead to a dysfunctional phenotype and disease. And, and a very many diseases are not Mendelian and they depend strongly on environmental context. So this is a really important area of investigation in the medical domain. So you can see the phenotypic plasticity and developmental programming have a lot in common, right? Really phenotypic plasticity, we tend to look at and focus on the outcomes, the different phenotypes that arise in different circumstances. Whereas in developmental programming, the focus is more on the, the process. What are, what are the molecular processes that lead to uh, developmental reprogramming of the embryo that leads to disease? And so they're looking at it from a, a slightly different perspective. Um, in uh, the ecological environmental area, we're focusing on adaptation under natural selection. Whereas in the health area, they're focusing on disruptive processes leading to disease. But there's a real opportunity here to draw upon the strengths of both of these areas in order to um, deliver some really good research outcomes in the context of sex determination. And so our IRC application that is currently under consideration draws upon the strengths of our genetics and genomics work done here at the University of Canberra. It draws upon the um, genomic confirm confirmational work that's being done at the University of Barcelona and the University of New South Wales. And it draws upon two health uh, institutes, the Garvin Institute and the QOMR uh, Birkhofer Medical Institute for, uh, for medical research. So we're bringing together the medical researchers with the um, evolutionary biologists with the ecologists uh, to, to um, bring out the strengths of each of these areas. Now, the, the, the phenotypic plasticity we're interested in is, a, is called a polyphenism. It's a special case of phenotypic plasticity because you have the same genotype, but discrete phenotypes where intermediate states are unvi unviable. So examples are diploid honeybee casts, uh, wings in the green peach aphid, and sex in dragons. They're polyphenisms and they're a special case of uh, phenotypic plasticity. So if you look at casts in bees, you get the same genotype, but discrete reproductive phenotypes where intermediate states are unviable. So you have the environment, which is whether or not they're fed royal honey, which um, feeds through uh, into signal transduction within the, within the cells of the developing bee uh, to influence the gene regulation uh, to force a decision which is an analogy really, but it forces a decision as to whether to become one or the other honeybee casts. And it's the developmental programming that is modified by the environment to lead to these discrete outcomes. In aphids, you have wingless and um, uh, winged versions of aphids, depending on population density in relation to food supply. So if there's plenty of food around, the aphids don't develop wings. And it's only when the population increases to a point where food becomes scarce that they develop wings and then can disperse out looking for new food sources. And again, you've got this environmental attribute, population density, that's feeding through the regulatory pathways to enforce a decision on whether or not to develop wings. And there's not much point in having half wings. So you either got wings or you don't have wings. And then, We've got temperature dependent sex determination in reptiles, which is the focus of our work, where you've got the same genotype, discrete sexual phenotypes, they're either male or you're female, where intermediate states are, are unviable. And the environmental variable here is temperature, uh, which reprograms uh, the development of the embryo to enforce a decision to become male or female. Okay, so this is where our model species comes in, the dragon lizard. Um, and it has uh, a very interesting system because it's got sex chromosomes. It's got ZZZW chromosomes like birds. That is the, the female uh, contribution to the offspring chromosomally determines the sex. 
unlike in humans, where it's the male contribution that determines the sex. So they're a ZZZW system, uh, and they've got clear ZZZW chromosomes that were demonstrated by Tariq Azaz uh, using uh, comparative genomic hybridization to identify the W chromosome, and then later show that it could be identified subtly uh, by standard C banding. So um, an interesting system, they've got 10 macro chromosomes and 22 micro chromosomes. Now we've built up over the time unparalleled resources to work on this species. We've got sex link markers, sex link probes. We've got a, a, a back library where we've basically in layman's terms, chopped the genome up, inserted it into bacterial uh, clones and we're able to pull uh, segments of the genome out at, at will from the back library. We've got a chromosome scale genome assembly now using uh, long read technologies and high C uh, scaffolding. Uh, we've got a dense physical map, thanks to uh, the work of uh, Janine and, and Tariq and um, Matt Young. And we've got uh, organ culture working, which is fantastic for manipulating uh, the system with uh, inhibitors. And we've got a lot of embryonic uh, gon uh, gonad and brain transcriptomes. So incredible resources to move forward in our research. Now, um, one of the really interesting things about this and what makes it a, a fantastic model is it, it's got GSD, genetic sex determination at moderate temperatures. And so when you uh, incubate the egg, eggs at moderate temperatures, you get a 50-50 sex ratio, as you'd expect with a GSD species. But when you push the temperatures higher, what you find is that you get sex reversal. So the ZZ individuals that would normally become males get reversed to a female phenotype by temperature. And so what we've got here is the intrusion of temperature into the developmental programming of, of the dragon embryo to reverse the sex of the ZZ uh, genotype to a, um, a female phenotype. And, and that provides a, a really unique opportunity to probe into the mechanisms by which temperature is influencing uh, the sex. And um, we've, we've, we've got, we use the markers developed by Alex Quinn to, uh, to demonstrate that this is actually sex reversal and not a, a case of differential mortality. Now, this, um, these sex reversed individuals are viable because when you mate a ZZ male with a sex reversed ZZ female, you get all ZZ offspring. And at 28 degrees, if you incubate those eggs, you get 100% males. So the reversed animals are viable. And interestingly, when you increase the temperature to 34 degrees, you get a mixture of sexes because some of these ZZ individuals are reversed and some aren't. And when you push the temperature even higher, you get 100% female. So Basically, in one generation, you're able to convert what is a GSD species using sex chromosomes to determine sex to a TSD species where temperature is determining sex. So it, it, um, not only are they viable, but you, we have a very rapid transition from GSD to TSD in the laboratory, uh, which is a, a, a really um, interesting phenomenon. And that, that got us into a big journal a few years back led by uh, Claire Hollerley. Um, now this sex reversal is occurring in the wild and that's really important because we're dealing with a natural system of sex reversal in context. We're not dealing with a laboratory artifact uh, that's where the systems are breaking down because of the pressures we're putting on it. This is something that's happening in the wild. It's a natural phenomenon and we're studying a natural phenomenon, phenomenon. Okay, so where does epigenetics come in? Well, epigenetics uh, is, is basically, um, it, it deals with processes that are outside or above the genes uh, by affecting the timing or magnitude of expression of those genes. And in particular, epigenetics provides the avenue for environmental influences to come to bear on gene regulation. So we've got the genotype, we've got the traditional genetic inheritance, which is um, influencing the phenotype, but then you've got the environment coming in and 
it's these gene environment interactions that occur through epigenetic processes, that is processes that occur above and beyond the traditional genetic inheritance processes that lead to uh, the phenotype. So basically epigenetics is referring to the mechanisms by which environment comes to bear to determine the, um, the phenotype. So they're the mechanisms that underline phenotypic plasticity and developmental programming or reprogramming. So we started to get into this um, by <clears throat> having a look at how epigenetics could come to bear in temperature dependent sex determination. And it's Megan Costelli and Sarah Whiteley who at a retreat down at, um, at Kailoa had, had an epiphany. <laughs> and you can, only, you can only describe it as that because they, they had this blinding insight that distracted them entirely from working on, on what they were supposed to be there for, which is writing uh, particular papers on, on this idea, which they've developed into a review that uh, appeared in biological reviews. And basically it's based around uh, a number of steps that lead to um, male or female development. The first step involves the capture of the environmental signal by the cell. Then the second step is once it's captured, transducing it through signaling pathways and um, subcellular localization of, of various elements of the regulation within the cell uh, to alter epigenetic processes in the cell, primarily chromatin modification to um, release or not release particular genes for expression that leads to differential gene expression of the, of the genes that are important for sex determination that lead to male and female development. So they pulled together this model, which we used as a foundation for our RRC application uh, by drawing very broadly from the literature um, to um, formulate a, a great framework for us to carry our research forward. And it's great credit to these two students to be, have been able to do that. So let's have a look at the top of this. Basically, the, if, if you have a look at the epigenetic processes that determine sex and you find some, some um, particular mechanism, you then have to ask, well, what's regulating that mechanism? And then what's regulating that mechanism? And eventually you end up at the very top of that thinking at, at, at a biochemical process uh, that's occurring within the cell uh, that's capturing the environmental signal. And so basically the proposition is that it's calcium and reactive oxygen species that are in balance that capture the thermal signal. So he, here's the example of how this might work. So you've got these calcium ions out, outside the cell that move into the cell through um, various channels TRPV is one class of channels that allow calcium to move into the cell um, and concentration in the cell. And you've got metabolism, which produces uh, cytostolic um, reactive oxygen species, which form a balance with the calcium to form what, what's called this calcium redox balance that has captured the thermal signal uh, in the environment. So both the metabolism is temperature dependent and the TRPV channels are temperature dependent. And so when the temperature goes up, it changes the calcium balance, changes the, the uh, reactive oxygen species and you get a shift in the CARE balance. And that's the way um, we're proposing that the cells are capturing the thermal signal. And these TRPV channels, um, basically if you allow them to reassemble on an artificial membrane, and you apply different temperatures to them, um, they are temperature sensitive in their ability to transfer the calcium uh, across the cell membrane. So that's the first um, uh, proposition that's in that, in that review. So we've got the review, we've got the hypothesis, and uh, then it's a matter of what experiments can you do to demonstrate whether this is or isn't the case. And so uh, Sarah generated uh, a series of experiments 
uh, based at 36 degrees and 28 degrees to have a look at how sex is determined in, in the embryo at three stages of embryonic development. And she found that she could distinguish between two really distinct pathways for, for determining a female phenotype. One is the pathway that's driven by chromosomal sex, and the other is the pathway that's driven by um, uh, temperature. And they're two really um, different pathways for producing a female. And one of the really interesting things about that um, pathway where high temperatures determine a female is that when you look at the transcriptomes in these embryos, you get these um, upregulated elements in the cell that provide correlative support for this model. So you get upregulation of the TRPV2 channel, which is responsible for uh, pumping calcium into the cell. You get all these other channels that are also upregulated that are responsible for pumping calcium out, pumping calcium both ways. You get, um, you get upregulation of genes that absorb calcium into the Golgi apparatus and other organelles. And uh, you get upregulation of a bunch of genes that are involved in um, uh, sort of reactive oxygen species generation by the mitochondria. So all of these uh, changes at high temperatures that produce the female sex uh, provide very strong correlative support for this proposition that, they, uh, that has been put forward uh, by Megan and Sarah in that review. So the next step and what we propose to do is to do the functional work using in inhibitors to increase the calcium in a cell and see what happens, to mop up the calcium in a cell and see what happens, to apply selective and potent uh, TRPV2 antagonists. Uh, so to impede the, the channeling of calcium into the cell and see what happens, and to apply antioxidants, uh, H2O2 that should be, uh, and uh, superoxidase uh, demutase uh, is another example. We apply these um, oxidants and antioxidants uh, and see what happens in terms of the sexual trajectory. And uh, all of these techniques have been well worked because this is such a fundamental and ancient mechanism of cellular um, organization that it's been well worked in uh, a lot of systems, including in humans, uh, particularly in the area of pain relief. So, so these are ubiquitous mechanisms that are being, uh, we propose, captured uh, in order to generate the temperature sensitivity of the cell to ultimately determine sex. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could switch off the reversal at high temperatures or switch it on at low temperatures by manipulating the calcium redox balance. And, that, and that's the objective of this aspect of the research we're proposing. Now, the next um, area of interest derives from some work that was done by Blanche Capel and her team uh, and a group of people in China, where they found that basically the chromatin modifying genes, the genes that open up the chromatin of your chromosomes to release genes for expression or close it down, these chromatin modified genes, JARAD2 and KDM6B, are really important in sex determination. So basically, at high temperatures, you get JARAD2 expressed, and it forms a complex with this um, uh, called a PCR2 complex, which methylates the promoters of our particular genes. And in this case, it's DMRT1. So they methylate the promoter and switch the gene off. And DMRT1 is the male determining gene in the turtle. And so when JARAD2 is upregulated at high temperatures, it methylates a promoter of DMRT1, switches it off, and you get a female phenotype. At cool temperatures, you get KM, um, KDM6B upregulated, it comes along and strips all those methylation marks off the promoter of DMRT1, DMRT1 gets activated and you get a female. So, so basically 
what they demonstrated is that there's a fundamental um, ancient conserved mechanism associated with the release of genes for expression that is involved in sex determination in the turtle. Really exciting stuff. Now, of course, who regulates the regulator? And I said before, there's a whole stack of processes before that that link back to the actual chemical sensor of temperature, uh, which, which I'll talk about later. Now, at the same time as that work, Ira Deverson and, and Claire uh, looked at Jared too in the dragon lizard and found that there's a retained intron in Jared 2, which is riddled with stop codons, which deactivates Jared 2, which is temperature sensitive. So this chromatin modifier that was identified in the turtle is also present in the dragon. And it's, um, it, it is, it's, it has an intron that is retained, riddled full of stop codons that, um, prematurely terminates its translation and, uh, and potentially makes it ineffective. Uh, and it depends on temperature. How exciting is that? So again, we've got this fundamental mechanism involved, involving these highly conserved mechanisms for governing gene expression that are temperature sensitive and linked through to the sex genes, at least in the turtle. And also exciting is that the intron re retention event um, occurs in this KDM6B as well. And it's not just in the tur it's not just in our dragon, the same intron retention occurs in the alligator and in the turtle. So it's a really ancient mechanism that's been highly conserved over 300 million years. So the next step in our research is to look at, um, I guess, uh, the transduction of um, uh, thermal signals. So once the thermal signal has been captured, how is it transduced to feed into the epigenetic mechanisms that then regulate the sex genes, switching them on or off? And this is a really complex area. And we've got some candidates that we're going to look at. We're looking at the stat genes because another study by Blanche Capel showed that the stat genes are um, phosphorylated in the cytoplasm in the context of the CARE balance. They're phosphorylated, move into the nucleus where they activate KMD6B to do the work of um, releasing DMRT1 for expression to lead to a male um, phenotype. So obviously we're gonna look at the stat genes. We're also going to look at uh, SERP B, PB because a single SNP mutation in that is sufficient to switch off thermosensitivity in another species of turtle. That's been shown by Turk Wren. And we're going to look at CLK4 because it's itself inherently temperature sensitive. So it's a temperature sensitive uh, gene in its own right. And it's involved in the splicing of KDM6B and Jared 2 And of course, we've shown that the splicing of those two chromatin modifiers are temperature sensitive. So we're gonna be looking at all of these aspects of the, um, of, of the signal transduction mechanisms within the cell. Now, Sarah's already got supporting evidence from the transcriptomics. Um, She's uh, found that the, uh, I guess, Jared 2 and KDM6B have truncated forms that may actually be functional in the sense that they may still bind with the promoter regions of the sex genes and block the PCR2 complex from coming in and doing its work. And so it, these truncated forms may not be non-functional necessarily, may, they may still have a function in terms of the reverse function in terms of blocking the opportunity of functional Jared 2 in doing its work. So lots of exciting things to look at here. 
Now, in organ culture, what we're going to do is, um, and we've got the tools for doing this, again, brought in from the human uh, cancer research, to interrogate the nuclear dynamics of CLK4 and KMD6B using nuclear inhibitors that have been developed by sort of Rao's team uh, in a cancer context. We're also going to be able to examine the cytoplasmic and nuclear localization of these gene products using IHC, immunohistochemistry um, uh, histology. And one of the remarkable things I think is, for me at least, is that the antibodies that are being used routinely in cancer research in humans also work in our dragon lizard. That's how conserved these systems are that we're working with. So here's a spread of a testes from Pagonoviticeps using the antibodies that have been developed for human cancer uh, for Jared 2 KDM6B, and their histomethylation methylation targets uh, on, on the histones. The, um, the H, uh, H3K27 is either methylated or unmethylated, depending on whether you want the promoter uh, to function or not. And H3K4 ME3 is another one of interest because it acts in opposition to H3K227. So really um, good targets to be able to look at and the antibodies work in our dragon. And here's the ovary showing that it works really well in the ovaries uh, as well as the testes. So some exciting work to be done here. Um, using IHC. Uh, finally, in, in terms of uh, this process, we're going to look at the, the targets of these epigenetic processes. So in the turtle is DMRT1. But one of the great things about this is that the promoter region that's targeted by these chromatin, chromatin modifier uh, genes doesn't have to be DMRT1. It could be any sex any sex uh, gene uh, could be AMH, for example, in Pagona. So we're going to look at the use ChIP-seq and other techniques to look at the targets of thermosensitive chromatin modification in Pagona. Uh, and we may find that it's not DMRT1, but another gene uh, that's important for determining male or female development. So that will bring the whole picture together really nicely. Ambitious. Now, there's another area that I just want to finish with, and there's a lot of work we've been doing up until now that um, is not directly related to the new grant, but it's exciting nevertheless. Now, we've got a candidate sex determining gene in Pagona called NR5A1. It's on the sex chromosomes, and it produces a whole range of different isoforms. So when it's transcribed, it's not just transcribed to one isoform, there's a canonical isoform, but there's a whole stack of other isoforms that are formed uh, th through uh, various complex processes. Now, it's basically in the ZZ individual, which has two Z chromosomes, these are, there, there are basically three isoforms that are present in the ZZ individuals. There's 59, 75, and 413. Now, as you'd expect in the ZW individuals, which have a Z chromosome, you've got 75, uh, uh, 59, 75, and 413 as well. Um, but you've got a gaggle of other um, isoforms that are only present in the ZW individual. And of course, that could be what's resulting in NR5A1 operating differently in a ZZ individual to produce a male from a ZW individual to produce a female. It could be these isoforms and the different mix of isoforms that are making the decision to become a male or a female. And so they're really interesting. Now, NR5A1 in the male and the female, when you look at the, the genomic sequence in the Z and the W, they're, they're pretty much identical. And so the proposition that we put in a paper that's under consideration by PNAS at the moment, and the reviewers seem to really like it, so we're hopeful it will get in, is that it's the chromosomal confirmation 
that's resulting in these different isoforms being produced by NR5A1. So it's, it's the fact that the W chromosome has more repeats that leads to a different conformational arrangement, bringing different enhancers in, into proximity with genes and also allowing for um, these different isoforms to be produced in the ZW than in the ZZ. So it's a conformation of the chromosomes that's important, not differences in the sequence of NR5A1 between the Z and the W. And the reason I've flagged this is because the third area that we're going to look at is the regulation of the sex genes. And we're also going to ask the question, is chromosome 3D conformation temperature sensitive? And if it is, does it have a role in determining whether an individual becomes a male or a female? So basically, and I, I didn't know this until relatively recently, which is a bit of an embarrassment, but basically the, the chromosomes have a 3D arrangement in the cell, I knew that. What I didn't know is that that's yet another layer of gene regulation because it brings potential enhancers into proximity with genes and influences their expression based on this 3D conformation. And so we've got this great now chromosome scale, fully phased begonia genome. It's not only fully phased in terms of the sequence, but it looks like we can phase out the high C conformation of the sex chromosomes and have a look and see whether they're temperature sensitive and whether they could be involved in delivering a sexual outcome. So um, we've got Paul Waters here and Aurora um, Herrera uh, are going to look at applying high C to pooled undifferentiated gonads to determine the extent to which 3D genome structure differs between ZZ males and ZZ females of 28. And we're gonna compare sex reverse ZZ female and ZW female gonads at 36 and see, is there a temperature specific genome structure which may explain the um, differential regulation of genes leading to male and female? So this, this is really uncharted waters um, and a really exciting component of what we propose to do. So I'll, I'll um, Start finishing up now by just talking about the fact that thermolabile sex for a long time was thought to be an intractable problem because every enzymatic process, every protein has a conformation that is influenced by the temperature of its environment. And so it was quite possible that sex determination under the influence of temperature was a consequence of a parliamentary system, that is a whole of system shift by temperature leading to a, a male or a female phenotype. And, and the, there was no specific set of mechanisms that were responsible for capturing temperature and determining sex. So for a long time, and it's been 50 years since uh, temperature dependent sex determination has been discovered, there has been very little progress in being able to get our teeth into how temperature is influencing sex. And that led to the proposition that maybe it's an intractable problem. But I think what you can see from what I've presented is that it's no longer an intractable problem because it looks as if temperature, temperature is operating through these ancient, highly conserved, epigenetic processes that are common to a wide range of organisms and where we can draw upon the learnings, say from cancer in humans and the inhibitors that have been developed to manipulate cells uh, to un better understand cancer, we can enlist that, that knowledge uh, to understand how temperature may be influencing sex in dragons. So it's a really exciting time to be able to bring together these uh, disparate areas and use all of these exciting tools to be able to delve in to what was once thought to be an untractable problem. 
Okay, so we've got our theoretical model in place and we've got a series of uh, sort of working, uh, we've got a working model which uh, has been pulled together from the literature. So every arrow in this diagram has support from the literature. It may not be in reptiles, maybe in mammals, maybe in birds, maybe in fish, but we've um, pulled together this uh, working model that provides a foundation for the experimentation that we're going to do in, in the uh, project if it gets funded. So to finish up, I'll just say that thermosensitivity uh, involves highly conserved ubiquitous cellular processes, which is a very recent development that's come out of the work of Turk Wren, Blanche Capel's lab and our own lab. But many of the epigenetic mechanisms are involved in human disease and particularly cancer, which means we can draw upon all of the mechanisms and um, uh, sorry, all of the techniques that are available for studying cancer, we can draw upon those uh, by bringing in Suda Rao's team to uh, examine sex in dragons. Problem of understanding thermosensitivity of sex is tractable and now within our grasp, maybe not the grasp of one lab, but in our grasp as, as a scientific community, and it'll require the contributions from interdisciplinary groups in cancer research, QMIR, in genomics, Garvin Institute, in genetics, our labs, to crack it, to crack it open. The outcomes will have broader implications for our understanding of developmental programming more broadly. So the mechanisms that we uncover through our studies will be of interest to a broad range of of, of research groups who are uh, interested in how environment is captured by the cell. There are a wide range of environmental perturbations that influence calcium and redox balance, not just temperature. And, and so there'll be a whole suite of opportunities to examine how those other influences can, in, uh, can result in the uh, reprogramming of development in cells. And we'll be contributing to that much broader scenario. Just finish then uh, by acknowledgement to the incredible team that's put us in a position where we're able to bid for a project like this and all of the results that have come out of the last project. And I really have a, a special um, thanks to the postdoctoral fellows and the students that are highlighted in red here for the outstanding contribution they've made and, and for the astonishing number of papers that they've produced in the last 18 months um, that have come out of this project. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with these bright young minds to produce the outcomes that we've delivered in some of the best journals uh, that we could possibly publish in. And um, also, of course, um, uh, Jenny, who's been a mentor to us all and, and brought um, fresh ideas and, and, um, and perspectives to the team. And I'll leave it there. And um, I hope it's time for questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Arthur. That was great. A real tour de force of the last several years of research, obviously building on a tremendous amount of work you and others have done. So yeah, does anyone have questions? Oh, I've got one. That's all right. <laughs> So you've talked about how uh, temperature impacts those cellular processes and leads to um, set, you know, outcomes in, in, in sex determination. Now, I was wondering too, so presumably temperature potentially influences a range of other processes other than sex determination, particularly during developmental stages. So um, I was just wondering if, if that's the case and whether the kinds of things that temperature might impact operate in a similar sort of a way. So there's a kind of a the same sort of pathway that potentially leads to temperature dependent effects and other features of the organism? Absolutely. I think the, um, the, 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 the capture of temperature by the cell, so, so it's got to capture, it's got to detect it and, and hold on to the state that it's experiencing uh, somehow in the cell. And, and the proposition that, uh, that, that Megan and Sarah put is that it's, it's CA, 
at CARE balance, it's the balance between calcium ion concentration and uh, redox. And, and so once it's captured, then that filters through the whole stack of signaling pathways that lead to different developmental outcomes. It could be the size of spots on the wing, on butterflies' wings, which are uh, temperature dependent. It's a whole uh, suite of phenotypic attributes that are temperature dependent. Um, you know, the number of stripes on the tail of a crocodile. This is, you could go on and on with um, the attributes of organisms that are phenotypically af affected by temperature. And what we're suggesting, I think, in, in a broader context is that once the temperature is captured by the cell, by the CAR e-balance, it feeds into a whole stack of um, uh, signaling pathways that uh, lead down to different components of epigenetics and and other, other processes that, that, that will alter phenotype. So, so there's a broader context to this. Sex is just one phenotype. There's a whole range of phenotypes that will be affected by temperature. And, and we're suggesting that it, it all harks back to that biochemical process within the cell, which is calcium redox balance. I hope I got that right, Sarah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, other questions? So I guess following on from, from Richard's question, so you're talking about developmental stuff, but presumably the same things are going, <clears throat> going on with day-to-day -day processes as well, right? Just in terms of physiology and other stuff, because a lot of critters are obviously experiencing a pretty broad range of temperatures through a day, depending on where they live. Yeah, so it, it's about reprogramming as well. So um, I use developmental process in a really broad context. Um, so it's not just developing in the egg. It's, you know, there are, there are developmental um, processes going on throughout life. And, and of course, um, you, you're going you're gonna to shift your phenotype in response to certain activities uh, or certain environmental components. A really good one, you know, where you've got twins and, they grow up the same as twins into their teens, and one becomes a bodybuilder, and the other one um, just takes on a desk job and, you know, behaves like me. And 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 you get dramatically different phenotypes. So so the developmental processes are occurring later in life, and they're influenced by environment, uh, and that's feeding through to all manner of cellular processes that lead to the different phenotypic outcomes. So so yeah, it's not something that just occurs. Uh, during embryonic development, it, it's it's something that can occur throughout life, and temperature can come to bear and alter phenotypes of organisms uh, after they've reached adulthood for sure. All right, good. Ben, did you have a question? I, your hand was raised briefly, but well, I, I did. Um, I was just going to ask about um, temperature acclimation because one of like a real key um, organisms can adjust, adjust their tolerance of temperature based on the temperature they experience. So over seasonal cycles uh, and just different environmental temperatures they experience, they can be tolerate colder temperatures or warmer temperatures. And whether there's any evidence of this, um, this particular mechanism operates with temperature tolerance. I know you're saying it potentially does, but is there evidence that it operates with, with, with that particular type of tolerance? I'm not, uh, I'm not up with the literature on that. I'm sure there's a vast literature on that, uh, on, on the um, changes that occur uh, with temperature in terms of acclimation. Um, but it, it, it does come down to the question of how does a cell detect temperature? So it could be that that it's through the calcium redox balance, but it could be through other mechanisms. For example, CLK4, which is a splicing factor that I mentioned before, uh, that's involved in, in uh, the splicing of those chromatin modifier genes, it's temperature sensitive in itself. And so there could be other mechanisms, other specific mechanisms associated with acclimation um, that, that also are involved in, in the, in the changes necessary to acclimate. Um, but I'm not up on the literature on that, but I'm sure there's a vast literature on it. 
uh, because people have been uh, paying attention to that for a, a very many decades. Uh, so, so maybe I'd put that on notice. I might have a look and get back to you. Um, I know that's an area that you're really interested in and, and the epigenetics of, of that and the epigenetic uh, marks that you may be able to detect in, uh, in your organisms in the wild is something that you're interested in, I know. Right, do we have any further questions? All right, well, if not, thanks very much again, Arthur. That was a, that was a great talk and uh, just a demonstration of, yeah, the, the breadth of work that, that's involved in this from, you know, obviously uh, ecology through to intricate biochemistry that's... <laughs> Well, beyond anything I know anything about, it's it's fantastic to see all of that coming together. Um, just as uh, just before we sign off um, at the end here, just a reminder that if you're interested in uh, reptiles and genetics, we we have a honours presentation at three thirty this afternoon in the gym presentation. Brittany Mendham's talking about chromosome painting in Australian reptiles as well. So just a reminder that that's on as well. Otherwise, thanks again, Arthur and. Um, yeah, I'll see you later on this afternoon, hopefully. Yeah, um, I've got teaching this afternoon, then I'll be at the gym meeting, so uh, Great. A busy, busy day for me. All right, well, thanks, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Um, catch up with you Thank soon. You, Arthur. Yeah. Thank you.